Hi everybody. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh. I'm going to give a lecture on coma and brain death. In this lecture, I'm going to touch upon only the concepts and I'm not going to go to details and bore you all. I'm going to talk only about important clinical concepts. Coma and brain death. What is coma? It is a state when patients cannot be aroused either to external stimuli or in a need. So coma is a state wherein patients cannot be aroused either by external stimuli or in a need. So what is it which is responsible for all of us to be in a conscious state? Only when you lose consciousness, you go into a comatose state. What is it which is responsible for all of us to be in a conscious state? The system responsible for all of us to be in a conscious state is a system known as RAS, Reticular Activating System. The reticular activating system comes in the brain stem in a closed manner and goes in a centrifugal manner distributed to both the cortices. So RAS comes in the brain stem and then goes to both the cortices. So if a person has to lose consciousness and if the RA system has to get affected, there are two areas. One in the brain stem, wherein the fibers are so close together that a small lesion can cut off the RAS and person will lose consciousness. Example, pontine hemorrhage. Person immediately loses consciousness. But when it comes to cortices, it goes to both the cortices. And therefore, if one cortex gets affected, person does not lose consciousness because there is another cortex also to compensate. So only when both the cortices get affected, person loses consciousness. So for person to lose consciousness, there are only two places. One, the brainstem. Two, both the cortices, not a single cortex. Very, very important clinical point. If there is an infarct or hemorrhage or cancer in one cortex, person does not lose consciousness. Only both cortices should get affected like hypoglycemia. Then only person will lose consciousness. So if a person has to lose consciousness, either the brain stem should get affected or both the cortices should get affected. The second important point is that a person can go into a comatose state either because of a structural cause or a metabolic cause. Structural cause, what we mean is that there is an anatomical disruption of the RAS. Like it could be a infarction, it could be hemorrhage, it could be anything else which, which disrupts the anatomical pathways. That is structural cause. Second is metabolic cause. Brain depends so much on oxygen, glucose and sodium for its survival. And therefore, the moment there is impairment of the supply of either glucose, hypoglycemia or oxygen, hypoxemia or sodium, hyponatremia, person loses consciousness. So, a metabolic cause like hypoglycemia also can person lose consciousness or a structural cause like infarct also person can lose consciousness. So, for a person to lose consciousness, either the both the cortices should get affected or brainstem should get affected. Point one. Second thing, a structural cause like a stroke or metabolic cause like hypoglycemia can push a person to a comatose state. Fine. Now, about brainstem, I just want to give a simple, uh, an important clinical point. In brainstem strokes, there is one important concept known as locked in syndrome. What is this locked in syndrome? Locked in syndrome is a syndrome wherein patients can't use their upper limbs, they can't use their lower limbs, they can't move eyes horizontally. The only movement possible is up and down vertical movements. How is this possible? It is possible when there is a lesion in the pons. When there is a lesion in the pons, both the corticobulbar tract and corticospinal tracts are cut off. So patient can't use upper limbs, patient can't use lower limbs. Since the horizontal movement, eye movement, the center is in the pons and since pons is affected, they can't move eyes horizontally. But midbrain is intact. Since midbrain is intact and since the vertical eye centers is in the midbrain, patient can move eyes up and down. So locked in syndrome, here is a person who cannot use his upper limbs, who cannot use his lower limbs, who cannot move his eyes horizontally. The only movement possible is up and down movements. We know many persons who have suffered from locked in syndrome but have done very well in academics by using a code known as Morse code. So locked in syndrome. Now how do we approach a person who is suffering from coma? So clinical approach again I am talking about important concepts. 
one you should know whether it's a structural cause of coma or two it's a metabolic cause of coma if it is a structural cause of coma the pupils will get affected there will be asymmetry of pupil you call that as anisocoria so if you have asymmetry of pupil like an infarct or hematoma going and compressing the third nerve pupil will be dilated on one side pupil will be normal on other side so the moment a person comes with head injury immediately check out on the pupil if the pupil is large on one side and the pupil is normal on the other side that means it's a structural cause of coma why is there pupillary asymmetry for example head injury when there is hematoma it goes and compresses the midbrain you have third nerve coming from the midbrain it goes and compresses the third nerve the parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve so when the parasympathetic fibers are compressed we all know that the parasympathetic cause constriction of the pupil so when the parasympathetic fibers are affected pupil will be dilated so one side pupil dilated the other side pupil is normal it's a structural cause of coma but one important point of third nerve very very important clinical point only an extraneous lesion of the third nerve will cause pupillary asymmetry that means pupil will be dilated because parasympathetic fibers are running on the superficial part of the third nerve but a dilated third nerve palsy which affects the center of the third nerve will spare the pupil they will have other manifestations of the third nerve palsy what are the manifestations of the third nerve palsy four d's dilatation of the pupil drooping of the eyelid divergent squint and double vision if there is a dilated third nerve palsy they will have all other three d's drooping of the eyelid divergent squint and double vision but there will not be dilatation of the pupil pupil will be normal because parasympathetic fibers are running on superficial on the third nerve whereas dilatation affects the center of the third nerve so pupils are spared in dilated third nerve palsy so there is pupillary asymmetry it is a structural cause of coma second thing if you want to know it is a metabolic cause of coma you ask him to stretch his hands and if you find nice flapping tremor what you call that as asthixis it is a metabolic cause of coma so once a person in a comatose state comes you have to know the structural cause of coma or a metabolic cause of coma if there is a pupillary asymmetry it is a structural cause of coma if there is an asthixis it is a metabolic cause of coma now the clinical approach i told about pupils and asphyxis second thing we check out on the respiration again fantastic super just looking at the respiratory pattern you can place the lesion if the cortex gets affected they will have change stroke breathing if midbrain gets affected they will have central neurogenic hyperventilation if pons get affected they will have apneustic breathing and if medulla oblongata gets affected they will have biox breathing so what are these types of breathing if cortex gets affected there will be change stroke breathing they they will be breathing fast absence of breathing again breathing fast absence of breathing so if you find such type of breathing it is a cortical lesion when it comes to the midbrain they'll have central neurogenic hyperventilation they keep on breathing very fast when it comes to pons they'll have apneustic breathing a deep inspiration just one or two seconds they hold their breath and expiration so you find apneustic breathing it is the pons when it comes to medulla oblongata it is completely chaotic and irregular breathing so you can see a nice change of respiratory pattern as the lesion comes from the cortex to the medulla oblongata rostro cordal way they come and affect it so cortex change stroke breathing midbrain hyperventilation central neurogenic hyperventilation pons apneustic breathing and medulla biox breathing so this is about the respiration third thing is posturing posturing is two important points one is decelebrate posturing second is decorticate posturing decelebrate posturing means extension pronation and they'll be like this so if there's a decelebrate posturing means the lesion is between the red nucleus and vestibular nucleus because vestibular spinal pathways are responsible for extension posturing so if there's a lesion between red nucleus and vestibular nucleus the vestibular spinal pathways they lead on to a decelebrate or extension posturing but when the lesion is above red nucleus the cortex gets affected they have decorticate posturing that means flexion of the upper limbs and extension of the lower limbs so again a rostro caudal lesion you can make it out by looking at the posture if it is above the red nucleus they will have decorticate posturing upper limbs flexed and lower limbs extension if it is in the pon between the red nucleus and the vestibular nucleus they have decelebrate posturing when it comes below the vestibular nucleus it becomes completely flaccid so by looking at the pupils by looking at the respiration by looking at the posture you can place the lesion where the lesion is and a broad approach whether it is a structural cause or a metabolic cause the differential diagnosis 
the differential becomes very very easy. There are only three possibilities. If there are lateralizing signs, asymmetric signs, pupil is involved. Lateralizing signs usually it is stroke, either infarction or hemorrhage. But if there are no lateralizing signs, persons there are no neurological findings, but it is in a comatose state. Then you think of metabolic cause like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, or hypoxemia. And third, if they have meningitis signs, you think of meningitis. So they have neurological signs, lateralizing signs. It is a stroke. If they don't have lateralizing signs, metabolic cause like hypoglycemia. Third thing, meningitis signs. They'll have meningitis. The treatment depends upon the cause. One of the most important causes and treatable cause of coma is hypoglycemia. So never miss a case of hypoglycemia. Any person who comes to a casualty in a comatose state. Always suspect hypoglycemia and give dextrose because it's a highly treatable condition and you'll feel very happy the moment you give dextrose. It starts sitting up and talking to you. You'll feel very happy about it. So always think of hypoglycemia. Then you may ask and wonder. Suppose if it's a diabetic, can I give dextrose without knowing his sugar status? Yes, you can give dextrose because that is not going to kill the patient, but hypoglycemia is going to kill the patient. So even irrespective of his diet status, you take blood and send it for sugar estimation. But immediately after that, you give glucose. So hypoglycemia, you give immediately dextrose. One of the important treatable cause of coma is hypoglycemia. Give dextrose. But again, there's a small catch here. In a person who's alcoholic, he may also have hypoglycemia. But don't immediately pump him with dextrose because alcoholics usually they don't take nutrition well and usually they have thiamine deficiency. So on top of it, if you give dextrose, whatever little thiamine is left out, vitamin B1 is left out, that will also be utilized, and you are pushing the patients to Wernicke's encephalopathy. So hypoglycemics, you give dextrose, but alcoholics with hypoglycemia, you first give thiamine and then you give dextrose. Otherwise, you are precipitating the person to Wernicke's encephalopathy. Then other causes you treat accordingly. If there is stroke, you give antiplatelets. If it is post seizure and tots palsy, you give anti-epileptic drugs. So depending upon the cost you give, vitamin deficiencies you give vitamins. Then another important uh, second concept I want to talk about is brain death. What is this brain death and why is it important? In death, there is nothing which is functioning. But in brain death, again many things are not functioning. But the only thing which is still functioning is the heart. It is still pumping and you can feel the pulse rate. So the only difference between death and the brain death is that in brain death, Heart is still functioning, whereas in death, heart is also not functioning. But why is this state very important? Why are we so much emphasizing on brain death? Because in this state, we can take organs for transplantation. You cannot take organs from a dead person because the organs are not getting perfused, so organs are not going to work. You cannot take a person who is completely alive because his organs are functioning well, he is alive. Why should you, you take organs from him? You are, you are going to cause harm to the patient. So here is a state where the organs are still functioning and the patient is not going to come back to life again. So you can take organs for transplantation. That's why we must we so much insist on brain death. So how are you going to diagnose brain death? You should know whether the cortex is affected, midbrain affected, pons and medulla. If all these are affected, you can call them as brain death. So how do we know whether the cortex is affected? If the cortex is affected, the person is totally unconscious, not responding even to deep painful stimuli. If the midbrain is affected, as I told earlier, the third nerve goes in the midbrain. So if the midbrain gets affected, the pupil will be dilated. So bilaterally dilated pupil not reacting to light indicates that the midbrain is not functioning. Pons. If pons is affected, corneal reflex and OCR are absent. What is this corneal reflex? When you touch the cornea with the wisp of cotton, both the eyelids closes. The afferent is first division of the trigeminal nerve, efferent is bilateral seventh nerve. So if the corneal reflex is absent, if you touch the wisp of cotton, the cornea and the person's eyelids don't close, that means corneal reflex is absent. That means pons is affected. Again, you check out on the OCR, oculocephalic reflex, otherwise known as doll sigh moment. What is this doll sigh moment? You must have played as kids with the doll. When you turn the doll to the left side, eyes will go to the right. When you turn the doll to the right side, eyes will go to the left. This is normal. But in a conscious patient, it is up to me to look wherever I want. I can turn eyes in either way. So you see this doll sign movement in an unconscious patient. As the consciousness comes down, this reflex becomes manifest. 
So you check the onside movement in a person who is unconscious. If you turn the head to the right, the eye should go to the left. If you turn the head to the left, the eye should go on right. If they don't happen, that means OCR is absent, pons is affected. Finally, you check out on medulla. Medulla, the respiratory center is in the medulla. So if medulla gets affected, patients can't take respiration. So if respiration is absent, the medulla is also affected. Then you may ask me, so the person is not taking breath, is not taking respiration, then he is dead. So how do you say he is still brain dead? Because you are absolutely right. So when the person is not taking breath, you immediately connect him to the ventilator. If you don't connect him to the ventilator, finally, the lungs also will not work and person will totally go in for death. So how do you certify brain death? Cortex is affected, patient is unconscious, not responding to deep infant stimuli. Midbrain if it is affected, pupils are dilated, fixed and not reacting to light. Pons if it is affected, corneal reflex is absent, OCR is absent, if medulla is affected, respiration is also absent. So this is how you certify brain death. So what is the main difference between brain death and death? In death, the heart is also not functioning, but in brain death, the heart is still functioning and you can feel the pulse. This is the only difference between brain death and death. Hope I have clarified all the basic concepts of coma and brain death. You've been a wonderful audience and I'll keep continuing these neurology lectures. Thank you.